Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. I'm Jason Abrams, and this is the place where we lift the curtain on the world of real estate like never before. Every week, I sit down with visionaries, pirates, and mavericks. We're here to document, demonstrate, and most importantly, demystify their game-changing models and systems. What secrets propel them to the top, and how are they living their dreams? This is about passion, it's about strategy, but above all, it's about real, tangible success. So buckle up and let's dive in. This is the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. From buyer's agent to billion dollars. Now, I know that journey sounds absolutely impossible, and for the vast majority of humans, it may feel that way, but it didn't for Sarah Reynolds. When I tell you that you're going to listen to somebody who has went from buyer's agent to billion dollar producer, and yes, that's per year, and then I tell you that she did it with a humbleness and a willingness to teach that very few possess, you will say to me, Jason, thank you. Thank you for this episode. Friends, buckle up. The journey that you're about to go on starts from the bottom and literally goes all the way to the top of the residential real estate industry. You're about to hear from Sarah Reynolds. I am joined by Sarah Reynolds. Sarah, how are you? I'm good, Jason. So glad to be here with you. What was your first experience with residential real estate? Oh, my first experience with residential real estate was actually... So my mom started in real estate when I was four years old in 1988. And so that's what she did to help provide for the family. So my dad is a pastor and has a low pastor salary. And we live in a very like expensive area. So my mom got her real estate license to help with like vacations and private school and things like that. So she would sell between like 12 to 15 homes a year. And when I was 14 years old, so I guess 10 years later, she said, would you like to make some calls for me? Uh, There's a script I can give you. Um, You can make a little bit of extra money. Like after school, would you like to make calls? And I'm like, well, sure. So I came into the office to the little Keller Williams office. No, I guess it wasn't Keller Williams at the time. And I started cold calling. See, I grew up as a pastor's kid. So when you're a pastor's kid, you actually talk to adults more than kids and you're held to a high standard as a family. You know, you're, you sort of live in a glass house. My father is a successful pastor from a size size of church. He's an author. So lots of eyes are on, have been on our family all of my life. And so because of that, I didn't think about it. Like to me, talking to adults is like what I did. And I never, I now look back a lot of pastor's kids have so much bitterness towards being raised that way. I think that it was one of the biggest gifts I've been given because I've been able to talk like at a higher maturity level as a very young kid. At that age, I I was just happy to work. I've always loved working and even young. And I, I just was excited to be with her and make the calls. And I would, she, she tells the story. I would come out of the conference room and be like, I got one. Like, yeah. I, it like all to like, I got one. And so I just, I enjoyed it. But that's my first sort of like memory doing real estate with her. And then do you stay linear? Meaning are you then in a real estate office the rest of your life or do you go a different no. route? No. And I never thought I would do real estate. So where did you end up? So I graduated from high school and then went to Liberty University and studied uh, business management. I never was like into school in high school. And then when I figured out that I was going to major in business, all of a sudden I found my passion, my calling, like the business world, numbers, tracking. I took a corporate finance class and almost changed to finance because I love the numbers part of business. And so I thought that that was the route I was going to take was in some type of corporate setting. I had worked, started working retail when I, was in, when I was 16 and continued to work retail all through college. And so I had a few job offers after that. But in 2005, she had to have major back surgery and couldn't show houses. She, she being your mother. Yeah, my mom. And at the time, she was selling between like 30 to 40 houses a year. 
And, but she couldn't show homes. About half of them were buyers. And she said, you know, you're about to graduate from college. What if you get your real estate license and help the family and you make money and you'd be great at it and, and, and do this. And we both sort of viewed it temporarily. I I did. And so that's what I did. The Christmas between 2005 and 2006, I started working on getting my real estate license. See, it's interesting because you you go to school for business and then you jump in to kind of help the family. Did you view it as you were becoming the CEO of a real estate business that day? Or did you just view it as kind of a sales job in the interim? I've always viewed my job super seriously. Like meaning there's not much I've done halfway, if anything, when it comes to work. And so I gave it my all, but I didn't think it would be long term. And I certainly did not think I would be running what I am right now. I mean, I still want to pinch myself. Like, how did I get gifted this dream job? Do you want to talk about accidental greatness? I mean, think about <laughs> think about what she just said, which is no matter what I was going to do, I was going to put my all into it. I happened to try this thing, which I thought was going to be a stopgap. I thought was going to be a placeholder. I thought it was going to be my quote unquote gap year. And now I've grown one of the largest businesses that the industry has ever seen within my space. And that's so inspiring to me. I want you to think about your life for a second. Better yet, think about the life of someone that's close to you that you care about deeply and ask yourself this question. Are they maybe living the thing right now that is going to be their unique voice that they get to sing to the world, but they think that it's just something that they happen to be doing in their spare time? Is it possible that the time you spend in the gap can be the most powerful time of your life? Is it plausible that the thing that you have wild passionate about right now that you think is the hobby or that you think is secondary or is that the side hustle that you're working on is actually what you're meant to be doing. You know, I read an interesting poll the other day that talked about the fact that entrepreneurs tend to open other businesses, meaning I've opened one, it just makes sense I'm going to open another. And most entrepreneurs, I think the stat was like 63%, don't quote me, ended up with some sort of a quote unquote side hustle. Friends, here's what I want to ask you. If that side hustle is something that gives you energy, if that side hustle is something that makes you feel alive, is it possible that the side hustle is actually the primary and whatever you're doing as the primary is holding you back from achieving your greatness? Because if it is, realize tomorrow you get to wake up and make the choice. That's what Sarah said. I gave it a shot and oh my gosh, look what happened. So I become her buyer's agent in June of 2006, right after I graduated from college. And I just hit the ground running. I mean, this is right as the Great Recession was starting. This We didn't know, right? We didn't know at that time. But I didn't know any different either. So, you know, rates were between 6 to 7%. And I was her buyer's agent. And I showed up my first day. I'll never forget it. I showed up my first day at the office. And I'm like, they're ready to go. Dressed professionally, because that's, you know, what you learn in business school. And um, ready to go. And I call her. I'm like, where are you? And she's like, what do you mean? I'm just getting out of bed or something like that. And I'm like, I'm at the office. Like, aren't we ready to work? Like, we're. And she's like, oh, I'll be there in a little bit. And I'm thinking, okay, this isn't, like, there's no structure. <laughs> Like no structure at all. And so I had to create my own structure. She brought with her a pile of leads, no joke, printed this big, one lead, each sheet of paper. I'm I'm showing it's like two reams on the screen right now, two reams of paper. And said you could call that you could call these people. And so I just started making calls and I got buyers out. I ended up making a hundred thousand dollars in six months in 2006 as her buyer's agent, splitting with her. So technically, I probably brought in two, 250, but I didn't love it. The buyer's agent part, when I first said I was going to help like help the real estate business and get, be my mom's buyer's agent, my dad said to me, you're 21 years old. And I said, yes. And he goes, you think people my age are going to trust someone your age? Just like that. And my dad is my hero, my leadership hero. He's a realist though. Like, so he's like, like he shot straight with me. A lot of people say, well, he didn't believe in you. And I'm like, no, he believed in me, but he wanted me to understand how some people could perceive my age. And so I started always wear a blazer to look like more mature. I adjusted to that, but I did have a limiting belief around listings. So my mom kept telling me. Wait a second though. I want to stay with this idea. So 
if, if I'm an, if I'm a newer agent and I'm on the younger side, look, I had the same issue. I started at 19 years old and I, I had the same challenge. How did you overcome it? Step one was look the part. You said, I always wore a blazer. What were the other things that you did? I knew all of the paperwork. Like I knew the stuff. Like, so I, I sat my mom down and I, I said, okay, what does this paragraph mean? What does this paragraph mean of any of the documents? And then under each paragraph, I wrote one sentence to describe the paragraph. So then when I would sit down with a client and go over the buyer agreement, for example, I would keep in front of me for over a year. I carried it with me and I would keep in front of me the one sentence and I would just read it to them. This paragraph says this, this paragraph says that. And I spoke confidently and, and because I knew what it said and I knew what it meant to them. And so they never questioned my age or experience because I, I presented myself with knowledge of knowing. I totally get what she's saying because I'll never forget being 19 or 20 or 21 years old. And then I'm going in and I'm sitting in people's kitchens and I'm saying, hey, trust me with your most expensive or liquid asset. I'm the guy that knows so much about it. After all, I have so much life experience. And I'm saying it now, <laughs> I can't help but chuckle. Gary Keller found himself in the exact same boat because remember, he comes out of Baylor University. If you, By the way, if you haven't went and listened to the episode with Gary where he talks about how he got into the real estate business, I'll paraphrase it for you. He graduates from Baylor University with a degree in real estate and goes right into the business. And the first question that he's getting from everybody is, gosh, you're really young, man. Do you even own your own house? How could you possibly help me sell mine? And here's what he said. He said, I'm a professional. And age doesn't have anything to do with being a professional. Would it offend you if I told you what I think a professional is? And everyone would say, sure. And you would say, great. A professional is somebody who knows what they know and is confident in it, but who also knows when they don't know and is confident enough to tell you that they don't know and then go find the answer from someone who does. And so here's what I can promise you. Number one, Anytime I know it, you'll know it. Number two, anytime I don't, I'll go find out from the right person and I'll come back and tell you. Friends, in this crazy kind of screwed up world, that's about the best you can ever do with somebody. Remember, your age has nothing to do with your maturity and it certainly has nothing to do with whether you're a professional or not. Professional means how you think about others and how you think about your relationships with them. If you're telling yourself that you don't have enough experience, that's just your own stinking thinking, and there's nothing that Sarah or I can do about that. It's so true. It's so true. I, I didn't know at the time, like, I just didn't want to not be confident in what I was talking about, right? But I didn't know at the time how powerful that was because it helped me. I didn't have the objection of my age. I didn't have, I presented myself professionally and I spoke professionally. And at the end of the day, I have found that's what buyers and sellers care about. And that's what the consumer cares about is they don't care what age you are or things like that, but they want to know that you know how to help them. And if you can show you know how to help them, it doesn't, it, you got to let the limiting beliefs go. And many of us have those. And for me, it was my age. And so that's how I overcame that. When you have the epiphany that you're, you're able to do the buyer side, you're having success, but you're, you're not in love with it. Do you switch over to the listing side of the business? No, I, my solution was to quit. I know, especially perseverance is one of my three top personal core values. Well, because I viewed it temporarily, I didn't view it as quitting. I viewed it as I sat my mom down and it was two years in. I'd helped a lot of buyers, but I wasn't happy. Like I, I wasn't enjoying the thing with, I was good at it. But the thing that was hard for me is I was on all the time. When you're with buyers and at the, and the way I learned it is they come in the car with you. So when you're good at it, that means you're in the car with other people a lot. And I was driving all over the place and on all the time. And I get a lot of my energy from actually being by myself and thinking, and I'm a very extroverted person, but my, I need alone time to like recharge. And I wasn't getting that. And so to me, I was just like, I didn't think of any other option. And so it was more like your back is doing better. You can show homes. And I sat her down. I said, I'm, you know, I, I think I'm going to go back. I have multiple job offers. I'm going to go do that. And she said, well, before you do that, I would love to talk through what I've seen. And I, I was like, okay. And my mom is the most intelligent person I know. So she said, you know, 
I think we could grow something pretty big here. And she had read The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. She had joined Keller Williams in 1999. She had started building a team before I joined her with an assistant and a buyer's agent. And that didn't work as well. The assistant did, but not the buyer's agent part. And she said, you know, you have so much leadership qualities, so much business qualities. I'm an entrepreneur visionary, but I don't like she, she knew she wasn't, not that she couldn't do it. She, she wasn't best suited to lead and grow it. Like the execution of leading and growing the day to day, the consistent meetings and, and pushing sales and all those things. She's a traditional, like amazing realtor and a brilliant visionary, brilliant visionary. And so she said, we could build something really big here. And I think you should do it. And I said, what do you mean? You think I should do it? And she said, well, I would like you to be in charge. And I was like, wow. So I was 23. And my mom says, I, I say she pulled a Gary and she hired herself her own Mo, or she bore one. And she just said, you know, I think you can do this, but now you're going to need to learn listings. And I was like, well, I'm too young. You know, dad said, you know, like they were not, how are they going to pay me and all this stuff? I'm so young. And she's like, you can do it. And she threw me out there. She forced it. And I learned to love listings. And oh my goodness, I still to this day, I could talk for hours about listings and the competitive side of it and all that. And then I started my journey of leading and growing what now is Empower Home. And so that start that was in 2009. So when you fast forward to today and we talk about Empower Homes, how many homes will you guys sell on an annual basis, ballpark? Last year, nine locations helped over 2,200 families, $1.2 billion in sales volume. Now, half of that was done by our headquarters location. So most of our locations are babies still. And so they're under five years old, which is a baby in the business world. And so our main model was built in the D.C. metro area. So Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C., and in Maryland. And we got that to 1,600 families, that one location. And so that, that's our primary, and that's our model we follow in all of our other locations. You know, I would be remiss as a host if I just let that just kind of like fly by you. 1,600 families in one location in a year for a residential real estate team. That's absolutely astounding. And and it actually highlights something that's super important. I talk to people all the time because I interview entrepreneurs across all different industries. And I can't tell you how many of them say, Jason, I got a money problem. And I'm like, tell me about your money problem. And by the way, if you at home think you have a money problem, listen to this. And then maybe you don't actually. And they say, well, look, I want to expand into other markets and I want to go and I want to scale and I want to grow. And all I need is the money to do it. Man, if you just give me the money, I promise you I'm off and running. And I, I want to just stop everybody for a second. Forcing your business to grow into other locations by putting pressure on your money might not be the best approach. Sarah grows her primary location to 1,600 units, and you know what ends up happening naturally? She gets pulled into other markets, and then they run that model. What if you thought about growth differently, which is you don't have to push it and then finance it to make it happen? What if growth was simply a byproduct of the success you had in one location where it gets so big and so dominant that it drags you kicking and screaming into the next market, and then you force that one to have wild success, and that success then makes you pull kicking and screaming into the next one? Friends, fight the urge to expand your businesses dominate in the markets that you're in. And at some point, you're going to look up and you will have gotten pulled into another market. And in that moment, you will be growing with a solid foundation as opposed to growing for simply the sake of growth. So the first step that I did when she put me in charge was I read the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book once a month for one year. I had heard that every time you read it, that's the grade you're in. And I was like, well, I'm going to become an expert on this. And so I read the book, which still very much applies to Empower Home Today and really specialized in knowing the systems and and knowing the models in Millionaire Real Estate Agent. So I saw a problem of lack of consistency with touching our database. So I identified, okay, my mom 
had okay business, right? Her and an assistant grossing about $300,000 a year. And she made a good living for our family. Okay. But their consistency around her 20 years at that time of, of past clients was not there touching them. And so I, I read the book and it said, okay, you need to touch people, you know, 33 times. And I was like, Gary, 33 times. Could you not have done an even number a month? <laughs> so <laughs> I immediately started calling it the 36 touch because that's easy for me three times a month. Okay. I can know, did our team touch them three times a month? And so I developed the R36 touch. I put it in place. Our assistant knew we, we systematized it. This is how we're going to do it. This is what we're going to send. This is when we're going to send it. And then we did not move on until that was fully running, fully going, and we were getting a return on it. And then I put a fence around it. And when I say put a fence around it, a lot of times leaders and a lot in sales do what I call shifting resources. Shifting resources leads to stagnant, so staying the same. Whereas if you want to grow, you can't take resources. Like I couldn't take the assistant that is specializing in the 36 touch and say, well, now go specialize in non-mets, right? Unless she had excess time. Well, yeah, you, would, you would lose everything she's working on. Correct. But people do this all day long. They do it with money and they do it with, with their people. They pull them from what they're working on for the next shiny object or the next thing. And they don't put the fence around what they've already developed and is already working. And so for me and our, to be transparent, I have to constantly, like I, at Empower Home, I'm like reminding the leaders, like, that's not what we do. And because I see them fall into this trap that many business leaders and many business owners do where they just shift, shift people and money, shift people and money. You will never get the result you're looking for by shifting people and money. You got to get it to a good return, put a fence around it. That means you most likely have to hire someone else that's going to specialize in the next thing. And you're able to do that because you got the return from the first thing. And so for me at the time, I mean, we had, we didn't have a lot of money. There wasn't anyone that was like funding the build of Empower Home. And so I only picked one a year. And this is something that I think is wildly misunderstood because I, I want you as you're driving right now, pay 100% attention to the road. But also imagine the hockey stick drawing. Imagine somebody draws a straight line, which then curves up to show the upward trajectory of something. That's what everybody thinks the drawing for success looks like. But I want you to realize that if that's the drawing for success, then there's a million other drawings that the arrow is going down or it's simply going straight or it goes up a little. And at the end, they're either going up, down, left, right, you name it. But you know where they all look the same? All of those drawings look the same when you draw the flat part of the hockey stick. And a thinking person looks up and says, okay, gosh, what's the difference between the companies that absolutely explode with that upward arrow and the ones that implode with that downward arrow when they both look the same during the drawing of the flat line? Here's what it is. Every company looks the same at the beginning from the outside. It's what's happening inside during that flat line that is different. And what I mean by that, the companies that end up winning are the ones that spend the first three to five years building systems, models, and culture. And those are the three things that drive upward trajectory. And the reason it works that way is because we build systems, she says, build a fence around it. We build systems so that we get reliable outcomes. We build models so that everybody knows what we're doing and when we're doing it. And then we build culture so that as we grow, we don't forget who we are because if we don't know what we're standing for, we are likely to fall for anything. So let me capture this for you slightly differently. Everybody looks the same until somebody pulls away. And the ones that pull away, it's because they mastered those three things during the growth year of the business. That's why the hockey stick looks different for so few of us as it does for everybody else. It's the hockey stick principle. Okay, so Gary has taught me this, right? So building a business for a long time, and I know people can't see on, on that's listening to us, but building a business for a long time looks like just a straight line. Like it, it feels at times like you're not growing. And then all of a sudden, you just shoot up like a hockey stick and your business 
takes off. And I mean, that's my story to a T almost. I mean, I remember people being like, where did you come from? And it's like, I've been here the whole time, like working my tail off. Like, I, I don't like, I don't know. What do you mean? Where did I come from? Like, and so the thing that I learned is put a fence around it. And then when you want to grow after you put a fence around for legion in particular, after you put a fence around all of your legion pillars that you've developed. And for me, it took a few years to do that. Right. Then you just have to do more of it. So of the same thing you're already doing, it's not that complicated. Like, okay, now we need more people to do the 36 touch too. Now we need more people to send our non-met newsletter to. Now we need to, to add another radio station. Like, so like you just end up doing more once you have that fence improved and are getting the return on it. Now, the fun part. So in the beginning, it feels so slow, <laughs> like one thing a year. The fun part is as you grow, you get more people that are part of your organization, you're leading them, they're growing, and then you can actually take on more problems because you have more people. And so now we don't do one a year. That would be, we could not do that, but we do have one focus a quarter. We're still not, we're still not different from that standpoint. We still focus. Can you take me through this idea of personal core values? Core values, of course, we talk a lot in the business world about what your company's core values are. And then I was introduced to it by my friends, Wendy and Jay Papazan, who um, do a couple's goal setting retreat once a year. And my husband, George, and I took the couple's goal setting retreat. And in that, they have you walk through your personal core values. And they give you about 70 different values and they walk you through narrowing them down. And they use that as a tool to talk to your spouse right? To talk through, okay, these are the three things that are important to me. And through that though, I have used them in almost every part of my life now. So I discovered them, I think now at three years ago, and it's really what is at the core of who you are. And so for me, first is impact. Second is growth. And then third is perseverance are my core values. You run this giant business, but you're also quick to say Sarah, the wife and Sarah, the mom. How does Sarah, the mom, interact with Sarah, the CEO in nine different states? And how do you have time for both? Well, I mean, I haven't always made time for both, which is for sure my biggest regret. And so when my daughter, so I have three children, Olivia, Caitlin, and Lincoln, 10, eight, and four. And Olivia, my oldest, I missed almost all of her bedtimes until she was about five years old. And I thought I was doing the right thing for my family. I turned into, not on purpose, but by accident, turned into the main breadwinner of my family. So I, I viewed that as I was doing the right thing by missing a lot of bedtimes and by, because I was working. And I surrounded myself, thankfully, by a lot of females that are older than me. And one of them, a group of them, who is my tribe, we started an organization called Her Best Life Together my first time there, they asked me for my schedule. And I'm coming in, I'm the leader of the biggest team that's in that room. So I'm coming in with pretty big ego, like, okay. And, and, and a little braggy about like, this is how much I work. Cause like I view work as like <laughs> something we should be doing. Okay. And I'm, I was proud of my work. Okay. So I come in and I tell my schedule, you know, 7am, my feet hit the ground. I'm on the phone with an agent. Like, and I, I work from seven to 10. There was a group of 11 of us in the room. And one at a time they went through, they have older kids. They went through and they said, you know, with Olivia, you've got maybe six summers. I said, well, what do you mean? Like, no, she's only five. Like, and they said, well, you're expecting her to want to be with you and want to spend time with you forever. And once they become teenagers, they get more independent. And you're in this critical phase of they want to be with you. She wants to be with you. And yet you're not there. And you're going to regret this time. And they just said, like, you cannot be working like this. And I came home. And what I was doing at night was making conversion calls. So when an, one of my agents would go out on an appointment and not convert it, I would call the seller and try to convert it. When, when you hear that in that room, did you feel it right away? Like, did that impact you immediately? Or did it take a while to sink in what had been said? I was mad. We were on Wendy and Jay's ranch and it's three, I think 300 plus acres and there's no Uber. So I felt stuck. 
Like I've never, they call it the hot seat. And believe me, it was burning up. I was so mad. I mean, I went to bed mad. I was like, how dare they? Like, they don't know. Like, who's going to do all that I do? Like, they want my business to go down. Like, I mean, I was thinking really bad thoughts of it. But I slept on it. And I woke up and I was like, you know what? They're right. I need to make some adjustments. This is out of control. And so I came home and I made the decision to no longer do conversion calls, expecting my business to go down. So the time that I was doing at night, the thing that I was doing at night, I said, I'm no longer doing. And I told the team, I remember telling my executive assistant, she goes, well, who's going to do it? I said, I don't know, but it's not going to be me. Wow. And she was like, are you scared? I said, yeah. I said, but I, I have to do this. Like I have to be home. And I took George to lunch, my husband, and I told him and I said, I told him about the conversation and I said, you know, I think I choose work because I feel like at home, you've got it all under control. Like I'm not needed at home like I'm needed at work because he's an amazing hands-on dad, really good. Like he handles a lot and, and is calm and he, he works too, but he's very hands-on in our household. And so I said, you just don't need me. And he looked at me and oh my goodness. And he was like, I just don't tell you. Oh my gosh. And, um, uh, sorry. Oh my and, gosh. And he's, he said, I, I don't tell you because I don't want to add to your stress, but it's not good when you're not home. Oh, he might be the best of us, Sarah. I'm crying. On uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so I was like, what? Like, and so then that, that kicked me in the, like, even again, cause I was like, wait a second. Cause he said, you know, our girls cry when you're not there. Like you're the happy of our home. You're the life. Like, and just, it was a powerful conversation. And then well, and this was, this was all surprise to you. It was, it was a complete surprise. That's the part that floors me. And I'm, I'm wondering surprise. how I'm wondering how many of our listeners think they know who they are, but might not have any idea. Yep. It was a surprise. And I know we're going on about this, but I've got to tell the rest of the, the story real quick because it's so powerful. So I made the decision to be home every night. For, so for three weeks, I was home for bedtime every single night. And one of the things that my daughter used to do is if George ever missed a bedtime, about one or two in the morning, she would wake up crying for him because she didn't say goodnight, didn't see daddy. Okay. Like I didn't think anything of it. Like she daddy's girl, you know, like, and so I was like, okay. And so for three weeks I was home for bedtime. And then my grandparents had gotten to an accident and needed help. And so for one night, for the first night in three weeks, I missed the bedtime and that night she woke up at one in the morning asking for me. And I realized it wasn't because she's a daddy's girl. It's that she needs us, you know, and that whole thing changed my life. And so I'm a big believer now in talking about counterbalance, making sure that we're not sacrificing our family or our health for our business, which is part of the reason that led to us starting the Empire Building podcast, which is all about, you know, not just having a big business, but an even bigger life. And I think so many females in particular don't think that that's possible. And it is possible. And I'm doing it. And there's many of us that are doing it. Now you have to be determined and you've got to succeed through others, learn to succeed through others at a level that a lot of people don't have to do. But it's something that I um, am very proud of now. The way I'm a mom and a wife and taking care of my health. And it's been a true transformation, honestly. I love it. I love it. Sarah, we would like to invite you to join us in the lightning round. These are short burst questions, and we'd like the answer oh. that comes fast off the top of your head. Are you ready? I'm ready. What is your favorite food? Feta cheese. Love that. What is your favorite sound right now? My kids laughing. It's so good. Everybody that has one knows that belly laugh little person sound. The best. What's your favorite movie? Oh, I'm not good with movies. I mean, romantic one would be The Notebook. I mean, so I'll go with The Notebook. But I've cool. got some good business ones that I like too, but or leadership ones. But I, The Notebook is a good one. Is there a book, and it doesn't have to be one you're reading now, but if you're recommending one just in general to this audience, what's the book that's in your head that you keep on your desk? A book called Remarkable. And it is, I read it many, many times, and it's a, a foundational book for Empower Home. 
And so I always tell team members, if you want to learn about Empower Home, read that book. And I should know the authors off the top of my head right here on my desk. So I can grab it here in a second, but it is written about the founders of Chick-fil-A. And so a lot of Chick-fil-A's philosophies are in the book. So it's called Remarkable, Maximizing Results Through Value Creation. And it's written by Dr. Randy Ross and David Sailors. And I'm a big believer in Gallup Strength Finders. And my number one strength is competition, which anyone that knows me is not shocked by that. And it helped me view competition completely different. It helped me view creating value for clients and customers and team members different. It's not a hard read. It's a really great read. So called Remarkable. I love that. Is there a podcast that you like to listen to? Without fail, Andy Stanley's on leadership is phenomenal. It's not too much of a time commitment because it's only once a month, but I have learned so much from Andy Stanley. I love it. Sarah, thank you for everything and thank you for everything you're doing for the industry. There's something for me that's so cerebral and that's so deep about the way that Sarah thinks about her life and her business. The, the truth of it is there's a bunch of us that had either parents or family members that are in the business that we're in, but there's a relatively few number of people that then take that nucleus in that business and absolutely explode it, and, and in her case, to one of the largest the world has ever known in her space. And when I ask myself, okay, you, you just spent all this time with Sarah. Why has she been able to have the success that she has? I believe it's because of two things. Number one, she is wildly, and I mean wildly, in step, in line, and focused on giving a consumer experience like no other. You want to talk about somebody who's close to the real estate business, who truly feels for the buyer and for the seller, who wakes up every day demanding. And I, it's funny to even say that word because I'm. I say, it feels like I'm lecturing, but she demands that the experience improves, not just for some of the people she's in business with, but for all of them. You, you can hear the deference and the way that she says X number of families that we helped. She actually used the word served. She said we served 1,600 families in that location. She lives leadership and more importantly, servant leadership in such a deep, cerebral way. That's number one. She literally wakes up every day asking the question, how do I make this better for the customer? And the second thing, do you hear how she talks about the people in her organization? Do you hear even the tone of her voice changes when she talks about the people in her company? She wakes up thinking not just about the customer, but about all the people that are on this journey with her. Let me ask you this. Right now, I want you to, don't close your eyes because a bunch of you are driving, but if you were to close your eyes, I want you to picture your boss right now. I want you to picture your business partner or your boss right now, and I want you to ask the following question. Here it is. Do you think that they wake up in the morning thinking about you, or do they wake up in the morning thinking about them? No judgment one way or the other, but you want to know what I learned from Sarah Reynolds? She wakes up in the morning thinking about everybody else, and she is so darn clear on, if I wake up thinking about the customer, if I wake up thinking about my team members, if I wake up thinking about my employees, if I wake up thinking about my family members, if I wake up thinking about everyone other than me, I'm going to get everything that I want. I have spoken to many, many people. And I can't find a better example of servant leadership. It absolutely inspires me. Friends, that was Sarah Reynolds. And there it is. That wraps another episode. Friends, I don't know what you're taking out of this. I really don't. I'll tell you what I want you to be taking out of it, which is these are the people that are having tremendously big lives. And the reason it's happening is because they're setting up the models and systems to do just that. Gary Keller told me that leadership is teaching people how to think so that they do the things they need to do when they need to do them so that ultimately they get the things they want when they want to have them. And that's what I want for you. You're all leaders. But it begins with leading ourselves. If you're enjoying this podcast, I want you to click the subscribe button anywhere that you get your podcasts. We want to be the voice in your head every single week. And every week, we're dropping new content. 
We also send out a newsletter at the conclusion of every show to make sure that you get the highest points and the models and systems that were discussed. So if you want to sign up, I need your name and your email address. Head over to the millionaireagentpodcast.com. Millionaireagentpodcast.com. Enter your name and your email address, and every week that newsletter will be in your box. Friends, you just went on a journey. I hope that what happens between now and the next time we meet is absolutely wonderful for you. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. The views, thoughts, and opinions of the guest represent those of the guest and not KWRI and its affiliates and should not be construed as financial, economic, legal, tax, or other advice. This podcast is provided without any warranty or guarantee of its accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or results from using the information. 